So Jude verse 24 and verse 25, it says, Now to him is to, who is able to protect you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy, to the only God and Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory and majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Father, we're very grateful to be here today. We're very grateful for the opportunity that you have given us, this venue, the opportunity to gather together with your saints all over the world this weekend who will gather together in praise and worship of you. Father, I ask that you would open hearts, that you would open ears, that whatever I have to say today that is true and in line with the teachings of your word would sink deep into those hearts and minds, that you would use those words to produce a great crop of righteousness and Christ-likeness in all of our lives. Father, we ask all of these things through the precious blood of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Now, thanks, Questy. I'm going to have to try and not kick it over. Now, you might expect me to start out the new year by talking about New Year's resolutions. I'm sure there's going to be more than one sermon on New Year's resolutions preached around Australia today. You know, those things that we, we make every year, I actually toyed with the idea of getting people to put up their hand and admit who made one, and then seeing who's actually already broken it. Because most of the time our New Year's resolutions don't last very long. We, we, we make these resolutions to do things like read our Bibles more or stick to our budgets or I'm going to use that gym membership card more this year. Although if that was your resolution, I hope you weren't intending to use it like this guy. But I'm not going to talk to you about New Year's resolutions today because as we start out the new year, I don't want us looking forwards at promises that we make that we're most likely going to break. I want us to look back at the finished work of Christ 2,000 years ago and reflect on the promises that he has made, which he will never fail and will always keep. So as we start out 2019 and we start thinking about the uncertainties that this year may hold for many of us, Let's look back at the finished work of Christ. Let's contemplate the certainties that he has made for us. Now, our passage today is the doxology at the end of this very tiny book of Jude. And if you're not familiar with that word, a doxology is an expression of praise or worship to God. And it's been wisely said that theology leads to doxology. And what that means is that the things we understand and know about God, and we learn about the great things he's done for us, knowing those things should lead us into worshipping God. And so my prayer for us today is that as we focus on Jude's doxology, Jude's expression of worship, as we think about the great truths that lie behind it, as we come to really know them, that they will lead us into worship and trust of God for the great things that he has done. And our central idea for today's sermon comes from the first couple of words in verse 24, to him who is able. And we're going to see this central idea expressed in two ways in verse 24, that only he is able to secure us in holiness and only he is able to perfect us in holiness. And of course, this should lead us into worship of him. So let's start with the first half of verse 24 and see that only he is able to secure us in holiness. Verse 24 reads like this. Now, to him who is able to protect you from stumbling. And I'm sure I'm not the only one here today who reads a verse like that and wonders, well, what does it really mean to be kept from stumbling? What is it that Jude is saying here? Is he highlighting the fact that God can give us victory over our sin and therefore can keep us from stumbling in a, in a day-to-day kind of way? Or is he thinking much larger picture and he's actually talking about how God is able to keep us from stumbling so badly that we fall away from Christ entirely? I actually think both of those things are in view here. But if Jude is saying that God's able to keep us from stumbling in the day-to-day sense of the word, why do we find it so hard to get through each day or even each hour without sinning, without falling into patterns of behavior that we know aren't godly? 
without grumbling against God because we don't have as much as our neighbours have, or spreading gossip about someone, or being inappropriately angry with someone for something that they've done. Why do we still fail time and again? Um, So, yeah, why is it that we still fail time and time again? I think the answer is actually fairly simple, although we often forget what it is, and so it's, it's worth being reminded. The answer is our flesh. It's the old man or the old woman who still lives within us. And even though he's been conquered by the blood of Christ, he still clings to life, trying as best he can to fight against the changes that the Holy Spirit is working in our lives. See, the flesh is a powerful force that for years has ruled our lives, and he's not going to go down without a fight. It's kind of like Gollum in The Lord of the Rings. Every time you think that you've finally gotten rid of him or you've tamed him and he's under control, he sneaks up on you when you're not looking and tries to throttle you. But why is it that our old man is still actually so powerful? I mean, after all, didn't God promise his prophet Ezekiel that he would take from his people their heart of stone, that he would give them a heart of flesh, and that written on this heart of flesh would be his laws? And we've got the Holy Spirit living within us as Christians. So what gives? Well, let me try to illustrate this for you with an analogy you've probably all heard before, but I was reminded of a few weeks ago when I was in France. I was able to visit the um, five beaches that the Allies landed at as part of the D-Day invasion of June 1944. This was the Allies' attempt to invade France after having been pushed out of France by the forces of Hitler almost four years earlier. And this is a make-or-break battle. If the Allies could take the beaches and establish a beachhead, if they could withstand the German counterattack, then the war in Europe is won. But if you know your history, you know there was 11 more months of fighting before Germany surrendered. So does it make sense to say the war was won? Well, I think it's very clear that from that time when the Allies landed at Normandy, Hitler actually had no chance. Every day the Allies are landing thousands of troops, thousands of guns, tons of supplies. The German Air Force is all but completely wiped out by the British and American forces. War is really over. It doesn't matter what the Germans do. They cannot win. But they don't go down without a fight. There are still many battles that have to be fought in those next 11 months. And so it is with the battles for our souls. When we become Christians, the Holy Spirit replaces our hearts of stone with hearts of flesh, upon which is written his laws. And he takes up residence inside us. And when he does that, the war for our souls is over because he's won. But there will still be many battles ahead before we can finally lay down our arms and rest. And how are we to fight these battles? Is it in our own strength, using our own resources? Well, certainly not. What is it that Jude says at the very start of verse 24? To him who is able. It's only the Lord who is able to equip us to fight these battles. We don't fight on our own, in our own strength, using only our own resources. We're fighting in the strength of the Lord, and his strength has no equal. We're fighting it clad in his armor, wielding his sword and shield, and because we're strengthened by him, we are sure to have victory. So why do we still struggle? If we're fighting this war in God's power and we're using his arms and his armour, why do we still fail? I think it's because in the moments when the battle is raging around us and we feel like we're about to be overcome, we actually stop relying on God's strength and we turn to our own. And as crazy as that sounds when we look back on it, Hmm, maybe I should stop using God's strength and fight this thing on my own. That's surely a great idea, right? I'm sure I'm not the only person who's made that mistake, but we do that. So what's the solution? How is it that God is able to keep us from stumbling? Well, unfortunately, God doesn't just zap us with perfection and make us instantly sinless. We're never going to be completely sinless until we stand before God in heaven. Well, rather, to borrow from D. Edmund Herbert in his, uh, in his commentary on Jude, this phrase, keep us from stumbling, depicts a life of moral and spiritual victory on the way to glory. A life of moral and spiritual victory 
on the way to glory. So while we will never reach a state of total sinlessness this side of the grave, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can live a life that sees moral and spiritual victories in the battles in our lives. But what does such a life look like? What are the tools which the Lord has given us to help us to fight these battles? The tools that he uses to secure us in holiness. Well, we do it by constantly feeding the new man and starving the old. We do it by spending time in his word, in prayer, in fellowship with other believers, just like we've done this morning already. These things are nourishment for our souls. Just like food feeds and nourishes and makes our body strong, so these things nourish our souls. These are things that we sow to the Spirit so that we can reap a harvest of righteousness. And if we're not constantly sowing these seeds, then there will be no resources for us to fight these battles. But we also have to starve the old man. Because the more we starve him, the weaker he gets. The weaker he gets, the less of a hold he has on us. And so we must deny him the things that he craves the most. And what are those things? Well, the Apostle John lets us know about this in 1 John chapter 2, where he says this, words I'm sure you're familiar with, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. So we need to remove from our lives the things of the world, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, the pride that we take in our possessions. And this might mean we have to give up our favorite TV show if the content of that show is feeding our lusts. It might mean we have to give up our favorite album, that one we've been listening to for the last 20 years, if the content of it is feeding these lusts. It might even mean we have to cut up our credit cards and be satisfied with living with less than our neighbors or with a phone that's more than 12 months old. It's going to look different for everybody. But I pray that as I was giving those examples, the Holy Spirit was bringing into your mind examples of where you are still feeding your flesh. And if he did that, don't quash those thoughts. Listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit at work in your conscience and follow him. Paul boils all of this down very nicely for us in Romans 13 verse 14 where he simply says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and don't make plans to gratify the desires of the flesh. But there are some of us here today, and I include myself in this category, that sometimes we feel that despite all these things, despite doing everything we can to starve the old man, despite sowing to the Spirit as best we can, don't feel like we're making progress. Sometimes it just feels like we'll never get rid of the lusts of the flesh or the lusts of the eyes or the pride that we're taking in our possessions. It feels like they still have such a strong hold over us. And it's at times like this when I'm tempted to doubt Jude's promise here that God really can keep us from stumbling, that I take comfort in Paul's words in 1 Corinthians. This is immediately after one of his famous vice lists where he lists all these things that characterize the lives of unrighteous people. And he says this in chapter 6, verse 11. And some of you used to be like this, but you were washed you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Some of you used to be like this. When I'm reminded of this statement, I look back at my life and I can see areas in my life where the Holy Spirit has allowed me to have victories over sin. And I hope that you can as well. Former slave trader John Newton said it, in such an amazing way when he said, I am not what I ought to be. I'm not the man I wish to be. I'm not the man I hope to be. But by God's grace, I'm not the man I used to be. And if you can see that you are also not what you used to be, then you are living proof of the promise we're reading here in Jude 24, that God is in fact able to keep you from stumbling. And this brings us now to the other side of what Jude means when he says God can keep us from stumbling. That he's able to keep us from stumbling so bad that we actually fall away entirely. 
So not only will God empower us and enable us to have victory in the individual battles against sin in our lives, he will ultimately ensure that we make it to the end of the war. Brothers and sisters, kids, this is one of the greatest and most comforting truths of the Christian religion. Despite our failings, despite our sin, God will never let us go. Just quickly, in your Bibles, go to the top of Jude, back to verse 1. And we see this same idea expressed in a slightly different way. Jude says this, To those who are called, loved by God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Kept for Jesus Christ. Isn't it a wonderful thought that we are being kept from falling away for Jesus? Why? Because we're awesome? Because there's something we've got that Jesus needs? No, of course not. We are being kept for Christ because we are the reward for which he died. It was the will of the Father from eternity past to choose a group of people that he would present to the Son as a gift, a people redeemed and purified by Christ's work on the cross, a people who, by the power of God alone, would be kept from stumbling, from falling away from Christ, so that Christ would receive the fullness of the reward for which he died. We cannot secure ourselves in holiness, but he can. Listen to Jesus' words from John chapter 6. This is verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Isn't that fabulous? Jesus will never lose us. He will never throw us away. And he will certainly raise us up with him on the last day. That truth should fill you with so much peace and joy, should make your heart grow in worship of our great God. He is able to keep us in love and in mercy all of our days. So let's stop relying on our own feeble attempts at holiness and rely solely on him who is able to keep us from stumbling. So an example of this at my cousin's place on Christmas Day, as um, she was leading her two-year-old son down the back stairs, about the same size as the stairs we've got here. She was holding his hand as he went unsteadily from step to step, and it provides us with a good, obviously imperfect, picture of what we're seeing here. As much as her son wanted to tackle the stairs on his own, she knew he wasn't able. She knew that if she let him go, he would stumble and he would fall. And he made it safely to the bottom of those stairs because, not because he was able, but because she was able, because she held him fast. And Christ is kind enough to do the same for us. Not only is he able to keep us from stumbling and falling away, he is also able to ensure that once he has led us through to the end of our earthly journey, he can present us to the Father in perfect holiness because only he is able to perfect us in holiness. Have a look at the end of verse 24. To make you stand in the presence of his glory without blemish and with great joy. Not only is God the one who is able to keep us from stumbling, he's the one who is able to ultimately perfect us in holiness, to make us without blemish for all eternity. Do you look forward to that day, church? Do you look forward to the day when this struggle I've just been describing, this constant war within ourselves between our spirit, uh, the spirit of God and our flesh, when that war is finally over, when the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit is finally complete, can you imagine what that will look like? I don't know if you've ever seen any of the photos from the end of World War II. There's great photos of thousands of people flocking to the streets of London, holding up signs, Germany surrenders, so much great joy and jubilation. People who never have to, want, never have to again watch the skies for enemy bombers or listen for the piercing call of an air raid siren. They finally have peace. But that peace is going to be short-lived because pretty soon the reality will set in that the war against Japan is still not over and the fighting must continue. And even when the war against Japan ends, we'll have the Korean War, we'll have the Vietnam War, we've got conflicts today in Iraq and Afghanistan. The list of conflicts is almost endless. 
every peace that we enjoy here on earth is always temporary. Every ceasefire or victory, it's never permanent. Brothers and sisters, kids, think about this in your own lives. Let's just pause for a moment. And I'd like you to try and think about a time when you were the most at peace or the most joyful. Maybe it was Christmas Day and you were unwrapping the first of many presents. Maybe it was your wedding day and you were looking forward with great joy to being united to the one you love most. Maybe it was the birth of your child and the joy you experienced holding her in your arms for the first time. Or maybe it was the joy you felt when you came to know Christ as your Lord and Saviour and finally had peace with God. These are all great things and we can ride the highs of these things for a very long time. But eventually, the shine is going to wear off. Our new toys are going to break or they'll get lost. We'll have our first fight with that new spouse. Or our kids will say or do something that wounds us deeply. Or we'll come to realise that living as a Christian is actually a lot more difficult than we first thought and we might be tempted to turn back. But when we make it to heaven, we will have a joy that is forever, that continues for time without end as we stand in the presence of God, fully sanctified, fully purged and cleaned of all the effects of sin in our lives. Then we truly will be without blemish and we will know a lasting peace. But how is it possible for fallen, stained and sinful wretches like me and like you to actually be perfected, to be fully cleansed of our sins? It's only possible because of the great exchange. It's the exchange of our sin and our guilt for Christ's righteousness and holiness. We see this most clearly expression of verse, you're probably very familiar with it, 2 Corinthians 5.21, and Paul says, He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And also in his letter to the Colossians, he says, When you were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away. How? By nailing it to the cross. By Christ's actions at the cross, our debts are fully paid. There is nothing left that needs atonement. We can stand before God in heaven without blemish because Christ's work is complete. By Christ's actions... Sorry... Our debts have been wiped clean because of Christ's actions. We get clothed in the righteousness of Christ himself. Christ is the second person of the Holy Trinity. Christ is God himself. He's the Lamb who is himself without blemish. And we become clothed in his righteousness. Brothers and sisters, just try to imagine what that would be like to be completely free of the shame of your sin. I don't know if I honestly can imagine what that would be like because kind of seems like our sin is such a foundational part of our experience as human beings, but it wasn't always that way. And it's not always going to be that way. Let's go back. Think about Adam and Eve in the garden before sin entered into their lives and destroyed what they had. They're naked and they're unashamed. They're both unashamed to be seen by each other and to be seen by God. They walked freely in his company, chatting with him at the end of the day, completely at peace with being so intimately present with God. But then it all changed. When sin entered their relationship and broke it, what was affected by that? Well, the first thing they noticed was their shame. That their shame before each other, but also their shame before God. And they sought to hide themselves from him. And ever since that day, We've all felt fear at God's presence. And what Jude is teaching us here in verse 24 is that there will come a day when we are perfected in holiness, when we will no longer feel the weight of our sin and we will be able to once again enjoy being in God's presence. I think we catch glimpses of this in what it might look like in our earthly relationships. Maybe when we've wronged another person, but then we've experience their forgiveness and the restoration of that relationship. 
I can certainly remember many times as a kid being caught by my parents, you know, doing the wrong thing and feeling the dread of what's to come. The discipline, the disappointment that mum and dad feel because I haven't done what they wanted, because I've let them down. I'm sure we've all had similar experiences. Can everybody here bring such a feeling to mind? But can you also remember what it was like when the whole thing was done and dusted, when forgiveness was offered and accepted? The feeling of that weight being lifted off you, of us once again being able to enjoy being in the presence of our parents or our spouse or whomever it was that we had wronged. That's just a taste of what it will be like to be perfected in holiness. Listen to these great words from Revelation 21, from verse 3. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more, because the previous things have passed away. Then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. I am making everything new. This is not just a return to Eden, a return to what Adam and Eve had, as wonderful as that would be. This is something new, something better. This is a world in which sin can never again break the fellowship that exists between God and his people. A world where guilt and shame and disgrace will never, ever be known. This is truly why Jude can say in verse 24, that we'll be able to stand in God's glory with great joy. You know, there is no one in the Bible after Adam and Eve who have been able to take joy from being in God's glory. Not even Moses, who spent so much time with God on Mount Sinai that his face shone and they've had to put a bag over his head just so he could talk to people. Even Moses wasn't able. Do you remember, he actually asks God in Exodus 33, God, show me your glory. Do you remember God's response? God says to him, Humans cannot see my face and live. Not the response Moses was hoping for. What about Isaiah's response when, in a vision, he sees himself standing before God's throne in heaven? He says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. What Jude is showing us here is that we will experience something completely different when we stand before God in heaven. We sang these words earlier, but they capture this point so well. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Bold I approach the eternal throne. Such a thing is unimaginable for people who properly understand the guilt that they carry. But for those of us who have trusted in the finished work of Christ, not only is it imaginable, we'll actually get to experience the reality of standing boldly before God's throne. Brothers and sisters, is this theology moving you towards doxology? Is hearing about these great and wonderful truths leading you into worship of God? Is it causing your spirit to rise in worship of our great God and King? I hope that they are. But if you're here today and you haven't accepted Jesus' offer to be cleansed of your sin, to have your relationship with God restored to where it should be, it's my prayer that hearing about these great and wonderful truths would actually awaken in you a deep desire to come to know this God. He is the only God who can completely clean you from the stains and shame of your sin, who can transform you from the one who rightly fears the just judge of the universe into someone who loves him and looks forward to his presence. If that's you, please don't just walk away here today. Come and talk to me after or talk to Jason who is leading us in worship or Shane who led us in communion or any of the members here at GBC. All of us would delight to speak to you more about these things. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how deeply you feel the weight of your sin. Come close to God because only He is able to cleanse you. Only He is able to perfect you in holiness and secure you in holiness. 
And for those of us that have experienced what God has done, there's really only one response that makes sense. We should worship God. If we truly believe that God will keep us from stumbling, that he will never let us go, and he will give us victory in our fight over sin, if we truly believe that he can cleanse us perfectly of the stains of our sin and cause us to be in God's glory with great joy, what other response can there be but to worship him? And I can think of no better way to end a sermon like this than with the words of worship that our Lord's brother Jude wrote in praise of God. So as the musicians come up to lead us through our final song of worship today, go back to your Bibles and let's just read verse 25. To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are, we are in awe of what you have done for us. We look back at the cross, at your plan of salvation, and we cannot help but worship you for the amazing gift that you've given us. We thank you that through your strength and power, you can grant us victory over our sin, that you can and you will keep us from falling away, and that there will come a day when we will finally be free of the effects of our sin and we'll be able to stand with great joy in your presence, perfected, without spot or blemish, for all time. And Lord, we thank you. Amen.